Hey, what's up, everybody out there in internet world? Your baller here, the golden mic from the north, Mao Power, on another episode of Powercast. And this is episode six. Man, we're tracking along well. Tonight is very special for a number of reasons, which I'll get into. Uh, but before I do, I just want to say thank you for taking the time out and joining me tonight. Now, before we start, as always, uh, it's customary for me from as a traditional Deva man from the Torah State to show acknowledgement uh, to the traditional custodians of the land which um, I stream from. And tonight, I would like to uh, acknowledge from back my homelands, uh, up in Kaurareg country of the Kaiwalag region, on Kaurareg nation land, up on Thursday Island, which they call Waibini, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land uh, and respectively show that extension of acknowledgement and uh, sharing that love and um, respect to all traditional custodians from wherever you may be tuning in from. Like I said, it's very special. Uh, one for the reason is I am doing this stream live from where it all started for me. We can go back 20, 22 years ago, even a, maybe even a bit more than that, up here in the in the Torres Straits. Uh, actually, no, let me go back 15 years. Um, Radio 4MW was the birthing place of where Mao Power uh, came out of. Uh, Patrick Mao as Kid Blaze was a, a, a radio MC right, um, back in the days. And I am now broadcasting and streaming live from in the newly refurbished Torres Strait Island Media Association building uh, here on Thursday Island on Douglas Street. Uh, from in where Radio 4MW broadcast, and this is very special to me. Uh, so it's really good to be here right now, home, bringing everybody back to Lug, as we call here uh, Thursday Island, uh, home in the Torres Straits. For those of you who might be joining in for the first time, this is Powercast, the place where we speak to empowering and inspirational people uh, on the topics of business, art, culture, and life. And you know, just bring people that I know and met, have met throughout my journey onto the program just to have a yarn and share life experiences and some of the amazing things that they've accomplished in their life. Uh, we go deep down and uh, they take us on that journey and share some nuggets and some gems and some you know gold with us uh, that we may take uh, as valuable um, knowledge and gems that we may apply to our life and our journey as we carry on um, you know, in our life. But also just to show that, um, you know, uh, there's some great inspirational stories out there. And to, in a time like this, where we're so focused on, you know, the the the, the news of in, 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 saturated information of things that make you feel disempowered, I like to be around people who inspire me. And, you know, this is why I created this platform. Powercast, if you haven't heard of it, this is what we do here. We love to bring in powering stories. I am honored to bring in a, um, a my guest for tonight's show. Uh, he's uh, an inspirational brother. I, I met him on my journey. You know, I've known him for, uh, for, for a while. Uh, and he's going to share his powerful story. He's an author. He's an adventurer. Um, this brother, you know, he, he's from Melbourne City, Victoria. I'll let him introduce himself. Uh, I'd like to invite to the program, joining me on PowerCast, the brother, Benji Brudden. Hey, brother, man. <laughs> Patrick, mate, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me on. Man, thank you, thank you for coming on. And, and but man, you know, we, we we shared some great experiences. Um, you know, when we first met, and we can get into that a bit later. But uh, you have a, a a really really um inspiring story, man. An author, and I, I read your book so uh, about the adventure, called, uh, the book called Hunting Fear, which we're going to talk talk about tonight. Yes, that's the one. We're going to talk about that because I really found it very inspirational, and um, especially from a, a, a male perspective about the things that you went through. Um, so thank you for taking the time. Uh, for my people viewing out there tonight, could you just give us a, you know, a, a backstory, man? Like, you know, give, tell, us, tell us about you. you know, who is Thanks. Benji? <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. That's a, uh, that's a great uh, introduction. But look, a little bit about me. I'm a 37-year-old guy from Melbourne. Um, I was the middle child of uh, a single mother, three kids. She was a Filipino woman, so she came over from the islands back in the 70s. Um, so life was really tough growing up, and we really struggled to sort of um, – we grew up in a very Filipino culture, and then we moved over to Melbourne when I was about 11 years old and moved into that white, uh, white Australian culture, and we left our Filipino roots behind. Um, and look. 
so it was it was a pretty tough road growing up being being poor we i was always mum was always working so i was always stealing food and and trying to make ends meet and uh, feed my um my younger brother and sister but uh, look i just went through life and I, I did i worked hard and uh, always i i've always been lucky to be a fighter so i think um you know i've always wanted uh, the family life and and, and adventurous life as well and um, when the family life sort of went pear shaped, I decided to, to embark on the adventurous life, and that sort of set me off on a journey in 2016, where I built a camper van and bought a motorbike, and um, learnt, taught myself how to ride a motorbike after losing everything, uh, which was my, my my partner, my divorce, my house, all my savings. I lost my job as well, and my father passed away. So there's a lot of loss in a very short time, and. Uh, Went on this journey of discovery and and, and self discovery and um, bought that motorbike and ended up setting a new Guinness World Record in 2019, where I became the first person to cross all 10 deserts solo and unsupported on my motorbike. So wow. that's a little little bit about me. A little bit about you, but that's a major <laughs> accomplishment. <laughs> Crossing all 10 deserts. Man, and the time frame, it was like under, how long did that take, man? It took just under 30 days. Under so, 30 days? Yes, yeah, so it was 30 days on, on a bike in the dust. Uh, I wore the same set of clothes for that whole 30 days because I had no, no room for luggage and things like that. And um, was, was averaging about two to 300 kilometers a day to get it done um, on a very underpowered, overweight bike. So, wow. Well, we, we, we were, before we get into that story, I got to take it back because we, we got roughly about an hour. I don't want to, you know, just just end the end just there. Now, like growing up, you said it was in a, a very difficult time, man, in poverty. And, you know, I come from a, a place where opportunities is very scarce and, you know, you do what you do uh, growing up uh, just, yeah. to, just to survive, man. So that, that experience, and I know you, you said it was to, to um, you know, provide food for your, your siblings. Um, like, if you could take us through that experience, but how long did that kind of last for for you? And I think, yeah, I think, um, I think that was sort of, uh, the reason why I feel like that's an important part of my story is because, um, you know, growing up, we were that, that one Filipino family in a, in a very white town or a very white community. So I always was trying to prove myself that I was, just as equally as good as as my white, um, you know, or as any anyone else in town, and we were just a poor, we were a poor family. So mm. I think from a very early age, I was I was driven to sort of prove myself and prove my worth and, and show that I, I was capable of of doing great things. I mean, aside from the the motorbike thing, I was um, I was a diver in the navy, and I was the, I was the best um, recruit in my squad, and I won that award, and then I, I went on to become a boxer. And I won a state title as a light heavyweight boxer in my early 30s. Um, and just I've always been really that really driven and ambitious guy for those um, humble from those humble beginnings. Now, it was in, I think, 2015, I, um, I lost my job with the Victorian Police Force. I, I wanted to, again, you know, trying to prove myself and be the best. I wanted to be the, the greatest um, public servant. And then uh, shortly after that, my, my marriage broke down and my dad passed away and then I was straight back mentally and emotionally, I was straight back in the gutter, feeling like I had all this, I had just like failed miserably as a human um, and went through a really depressed state uh, mentally and I felt like I needed to get back up on the horse and prove myself and, and show to the world that I was capable of doing something, um, I guess, inspirational. And that yeah. was sort of what led me to, to start uh, doing not only the desert ride, but I explored the compass points of the country. I rode yes. my bike solo from, from Cairns to Cape York. Um, yes. I've done, I explored all through Kakadu and climbed, climbed the escarpment malls there. And there was countless, uh, countless expeditions I did before I ever got to the desert, which were just as, um, just as dangerous and just as yeah. just as crazy, it's just that the yeah. desert. The desert one was the one that got the um, the accolades with the, with the Guinness World Record. Yes, yes. There were a couple of um, of the, those um, 
journeys that uh, uh, that you did with your bike that I want to talk about, uh, but we won't get into them just yet. Now, reading your book, the title "Hunting Fear," well, that's a that's a very catchy title, and um, you know it's captivating. It kind of um, you know embodies what you're talking about. But people, you know, when they see the title, they can um, uh, interpret it, you know, re relate to it because they can interpret it some some way personally. So, how did that title come about? I think, yeah, so great question, Pat. And, you know, it was simply um, living a life in, you know, I guess that suburban life, that pick, suburban picket fence life, you were never really encouraged to break out of the mold. Although, you know, I, was, I did the boxing thing and a few other things. Like if you're following, I guess if you're following the flock or being sheep in society, then you're never encouraged to, to break outside the realm. And I secretly always wanted to live this adventurous life and, and do some adventurous things, but no one would ever come with me. Or I always found uh, it, was, it was hard. So when I decided, when I got divorced and um, went on this journey, I just thought, well, I'm going to actually go out and face all those fears. And there was certainly a mm. number of times, number of times um, where I felt real fear, like when I was in the middle of the uh, sand dunes of Robe or uh, deep in the deserts of Western Australia, in the early days. Now, every time I overcame something and, and and conquered a challenge, it sort of expanded my realm of possibility. And I actually went out and actively started to search out that feeling of fear. Oh, well, I've done this. What can I do next? What is the next thing? What is the next thing? And so yeah. I guess it was like hunting fear. I was, I was hunting that feeling so I could overcome it. Yeah. That's, that's a great way to put it, man. And I can, I felt that from the book. Uh, and one thing I got to say, it's a, it's a great and easy read. I'm not a person who likes to visually read thick books. I do it if it interests me, and I'm more of an audio book listener. But um, it took me a day and a half to go through and really absorb it. It was really, uh, I found it really um, inspiring. And the one thing that stood out uh, for me is you show two parallels of yourself as a person, one that you're this very highly driven, want to be the best, you know, and stand out just to show that you're just as good or, um, you know, who can compete in that realm. But then when all of this happens and this pressure, you show the vulnerability of um, the emotions that males never get, are, are taught to at a very young age not to not to um, express or not to explore. We just shut, push it away because yeah. it's not that idea of what a manly thing is. And um, what, what was it like being that open and vulnerable in this process? Look, when I set out to to, to share this story, I, I didn't want it to be uh, macho, I did this and I did that and I did all these great things and look at me, macho, macho, because that one, th those, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't land with people. Like I really wanted to be raw and real and upfront and honest that, you know, so I have done this thing, but I was shitting my pants the whole time and I was so nervous and there were times where I just wanted to throw up. My, my anxiety was through the roof and those were all very human emotions. Um, and I think with uh, mental health, I did the, I also did the ride for mental health and to raise money and awareness for the Black yes. Dog Institute. Yes. Um, now I, I wanted to be an advocate for mental health, so uh, it, it's not it's not weakness um, to to show you that you're vulnerable. In fact, if you if you here's a great um, analogy. So if you ever ask anyone anyone who knows a great um, act of courage, there needs to be a certain level of vulnerability to 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 display that courage. Uh, you can't have one can't land without the other. Um, something for your listeners to think about. So I think by being so honest and raw, it really has allowed me to um, to, to to resonate with a lot of people. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I I, I knew from the moment when you were expressing the emotions of going through um, your your um, divorce and breakup and speaking about that, you know, honestly and opening. Uh, openly, um, not many people go into and see from a male perspective. And I know going through a massive, you know, breakup myself where I have three mm. kids involved and, you know, I'm glad that my, my partner, my ex-partner and I are in a great space. But it, it, when you go through that journey, right, it's, 
there is like no handbooks or textbooks can tell you how to do there it. There isn't. It's, right? yeah. it's like, you know, I remember I didn't know what to, to do in that moment. So how did you cope with what, what did you do when you when that happened, when you were going through this? Yeah, it was so my divorce process and, you know, not, again, it was like a like compiling. It was like losing my job, getting divorced, you know, loss of a loved one. Uh, it was all those things, and yeah, you know, I'll be honest. Like, I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. For twelve months, I was, I just got drunk and tried to forget the whole thing. But I also journaled all my thoughts, and yeah, you know, it was almost like a year of, of year of just um, like getting really reckless and, and really mm. sort of off the rails. I sort of looked at myself in the mirror and said, you know what? If I do this for another year, I will be dead or bankrupt, or you know, I'll, I'll certainly alienate everyone who loves me. So yes. I knew I couldn't keep on going down that path. And yeah. um, and during that time, I was also building my van, which is the camper van. I lived in that for nearly nearly 18 months as I traveled around the country and, and explored. And, and ex so the motorbike was strapped to the back of that. So that van and that motorbike was sort of like the vessel that um, took me away from from being that destructive person and mm. I use that that motorbike especially was the tool I used to to help heal. Um, yes. And look, I, you know, yeah, I wear my heart on my sleeve. So I, I'll be honest as hell. Like, you know, we were um, there. There were some pretty dark times, and I go into them in depth in the book. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah. One of the situations was uh, waking up on a park bench in front of a church at two That's p.m. in the afternoon, covered in my own yeah. piss and spew. So that was a pretty harrowing experience, and and I'm sure that. Uh, your listeners are probably laughing because they've all probably had that piss and spew moment in their life at some stage. Yes, that was very <laughs> uh, that, <laughs> that that stood up. I mean, it got to me laugh about it, but it, it really was. It showed that um, this was a like it, it gave context of value to what I was reading because it showed that you were at this place and you were really. Uh, on a journey after everything started to change, on that journey to find that better place, uh, and that that was a part of that that um, that nomad's journey. I think going around and you know finding places of healing throughout the country, uh, some beautiful places and some beautiful stories which we'll get into. Um, yeah. Yo, know, one thing that was interesting. I'm going to start uh, two questions. I I want to ask. First of all, I I, I really wanted to ask um, why write this book. So I, I'm lucky. I've always been a writer. Like, a, like I'm a, like. So my day job is I'm a tradie. I'm, I'm a roofer by day. So I wear high vis. I'm swinging a hammer all day. Now my mum, when I was younger, she always encouraged me to write. And you know, we we had we did have a very hard childhood, and there was abusive boyfriends and and drug and alcohol um, abuse and all, all that sort of stuff. So I've actually this is my second book. Mm -hmm. So I actually wrote. A, um, another book uh, about my early life and overcoming a lot of pain in that. So it's basically the same sort of genre, the you know, same sort of story in the sense that there's a lot of pain and suffering and rise up and overcome. And that's the book that got me kicked out of the police force. So I, I wanted to get to, to get to that. It was, <laughs> that was so interesting that because um, you spoke about how real this book was and you you there, there was nothing spared in it. <laughs> That, that was the, the, the first book, right? And because of a book, you got let go from from the police force. I, I was I was shocked. I didn't know well, what was going on. It, you know, in hindsight, hindsight's a magnificent thing. And you know what? Don't get me wrong. I, I hold no no ill feelings towards them. Like I'm I'm living my best life now, and I'm so grateful for the whole experience in hindsight. Now. Look, obviously my first book, which I never bothered to publish because this book is the same story um, about a man overcoming, you know, the, 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 the battler, the battler and the underdog just coming up, rising yeah. up and beating the odds. The same story. But the first book just had a lot of, you know, it was a lot of dark, dark times when I was a kid. So they just said I was a liability to the police force and they said, y y you're too high risk. And I said, bah, go stuff yourself and uh, got on a <laughs> motorbike. And so, I, and I talk about that in the opening chapters of this book, um, yes. and some of the some of the conversations. 
Yes. Um, I, I'd like to take a moment to say good night to everybody joining in. I got Mari uh, from Cairns, uh, Saban from down in um, in Victoria. I got um, uh, Dwayne all the way from Townsville. Thank you guys for dropping comments. Please ask more questions and drop comments if you're tuning in. Uh, I hope you're enjoying this program. And thank you to everybody who's tuning in right now from wherever you are. We appreciate your time. Um, yes, and... and Going back to the, our story, brother, you, this book, you you actually dedicated it to your mom, yeah? I did, yeah. She's been, uh, yes. she's been a driving force in my life. Um, so, you know, she uh, was an amazing woman, strong woman, uh, raised three kids by herself in a foreign country yep. and worked around the clock to get to provide a life for us. Um, unfortunately, lost her fight with cancer when I was 19 years old. Um, so she, although she hasn't been with, with us now for nearly 20 years or 18 years, um, certainly through this journey, I, I have a very close relationship with her still spiritually. Um, she's very, um, we're very close. So, um, and she cer certainly helped me, her, helped me write this book and, and she's guided my hand through the whole process. And she certainly was with me when I was in the desert or certainly in some of the wilder parts of the country, keeping me alive. Um, I, I, I cannot, you cannot convince me otherwise. Just there was, there was some crazy miracles that happened out there that were just like too uncanny to be a coincidence. Yeah. I just think about my mother all the time when those things happen. Amazing. Amazing. And, um, yeah. So that's, that's, thank you. That's powerful, man, for sharing that. Uh, and I read that I, I was really moved by you know, that, that um, sentiment and telling the story about how she was a very big influence um, at the beginning of the writing. Uh, it really made sense and it had context to it uh, throughout your journey. Now, another thing that stood out for me in this was that you actually, at the end of um, uh, the chapters going through, following the first two chapters, you actually dropped your goals. And then these are goals that you, like, the book actually is a develop, personal development book as well as a storytelling, because you actually share the goals that you've applied on your journey through that, that transition. Uh, and, no. uh, sorry? Yes, sorry, keep going. I, I agree, yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, and so I wanted to, to uh, get into, you know, what was the purpose behind that and how did that come about? Yeah, actually, it was completely by accident. But when I, you know, because I was... When I started riding on my motorbike, um, and I, I'd venture out, for, so my first expedition into some sand dunes might have been 30 kilometers, the next one might have been 70, the next one might have been 100, until eventually the desert one was like 7,000 kilometers or 8,000 kilometers. Um, but every time I'd, I'd come back from one of these adventures, I'd have like a little debriefing session with myself and work out what went wrong, what went right, what do I need to do to improve, how can I, you know, and it was literally all about the motorbike and how could I, how could I survive? How could I survive the next adventure? Um, mm. So it really, it really came down to, um, like in in the in the book, the first thing I do is I say, well, you need a goal, you know. So there was never a time where I just kind of rode off into the bush willy nilly. Like I'd say, oh, well, I've got two hundred k fuel range, I can go two hundred k's out, or I'm going to have to take extra fuel, or whatever the case might be. So there always needed to be a very defined goal, or a route, or a strategy to where I was going or the distances I was traveling. Um, hmm. And I, I've actually just, I've applied these, um, the, I guess the rules that I've, I've I created in the bush, I've applied them to my life and, and they're just, they're so um, versatile in that I've applied them to my business. Um, I'm always, I'm always writing to-do lists every day. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously like having a plan and like when I did the desert thing, I would put up vision boards all over my room. Of I draw pictures of Wolf Creek Crater and and um, have uh, a map of Australia just posted up on my wall, so I knew all the distances between all my fuel stops and and how much food I would need to carry and how much water I would need and where I need to post resupply packs into Aboriginal communities, and all of these 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 planning and um, you know setting goals and, and and building a team around me and, and all those things just really helped me um helped my 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 uh ability to succeed or my success rate yeah. and I, i've done the same thing to 
I've done the same thing in my life and, and I've found that the same rules apply. The mm. same rules apply. Um, have a goal, set a plan, build a team around mm. you, um, mm. share, share your vision, like get people on the same page. So, um, and, and I think it, it, it just worked for me so many times, so often, so well, and it continues to work for me today. And that, and that's why I felt it was it was important to share them in the in the book, and then literally show how I applied them in my ex the, the expedition that crossed the deserts, and it, it worked. I mean, that's that's great, man, and I, I really enjoyed that. I really gave context. Um, I'm just putting up a link. Um, if you can see it, everybody is tuning in. Uh, DaringToVenture.com.au. That's where you can go check out more of the story of Benji, and um, also get the book. Uh, and yeah. yeah, there's some great great stuff in there. Now, let's go back to the let's go to the journey. Now, like I know it's in the book, but I want to talk about the, the journey. Uh, Ten deserts, man, and each one of them. Uh, uh, are very profound and you explain them the how like some of the experience that you went through each individual desert but before that you said that you went on a traveling a trek around like the country i remember that you shared uh was it kakadu that you spent some time up, up yes yes, yes. So I, was, I was extremely lucky to to spend some time so i went around the, the country in a clockwise direction leaving from melbourne and following the coast all the way to perth and then up the west coast and and when I got to Kakadu, it was the, the start of the dry season. So I was, I was lucky enough to get a job uh, in one of the resorts in the park. And um, so I spent four months in Kakadu and, you know, just fell in love with the place, met the traditional owners and, and became friends with them. So they invited me out to – so really the general pub, public, for example, only see about 10% of the park. There's, a, there's only uh, – there's an escarpment wall in Kakadu that runs – um, I think 500 kilometres um, north to mm. south. Now, there's only mm. five waterfalls open to the, the general public. Mm. There are literally hundreds of waterfalls that people don't get to see or appreciate. And uh, mm. the traditional owners would, would sort of draw pirate maps for me and, and show me how to get to certain places. And wow. uh, I just get on my motorbike and ride across these floodplains and, and find herds of wild horses and... You know, get chased by buffalo or cross uh, cro <laughs> crocodile. Yeah, or I'd get chased by a crocodile. Uh, sorry, cross crocodile infested rivers. Um, mm. The place is just teeming with wildlife. It was an absolute odyssey, just Kakadu in itself. And um, after four months in Kakadu, I just thought, well, I can definitely do the deserts. I knew, I, I know I can. There's, there's no, there's, if I can survive this and live through all of this, <laughs> this, this wild adventure, then there's nothing that can hold me back. Deadly, man. And to be, you know, uh, guided and uh, accepted and, you know, getting permission from traditional owners to go to explore those parts, that's a blessing in itself. And I, I really found that um, it was, I, I enjoyed that you mentioned that in there. So anybody who read it, they would get context about the connection, not only for land, but being able to have connection with the traditional custodians of the land. And as you see at the beginning of the show, I always pay acknowledgement. Uh, and that's mm. because there's the spirit energy that comes around with the place that you're, you're the visiting or at at the time. Yeah, oh, look, Kakadu was a magical place. And I got, so, because I spent so much time on the land and part of the land, I felt a real connection to the land. And I really mm. began to understand um, when when the indigenous Australians talk about connection to the land and being and you know being a part of the land and how it's you know the spirits of the land, I really got that. I really, really did, and it was special. It really was amazing, man. I'm glad you put it in the book. Now to the deserts, ten deserts, Guinness Book record. Like, yeah, that's amazing. Now I, I gotta ask, which which one were you the most concerned about coming into this? Mate, they were all so um, – they were all so unique. And I broke it up to the eastern deserts, the central deserts, and the western deserts, you know, as in just yeah. three blocks. But by far the most – I think the most mentally challenging was the east – the central deserts because they are just so isolated. So the Great Victorian Desert stretches across South Australia, and I mm -hmm. travelled from east to west. Now, I didn't see a car for nearly four days. 
uh, mm. during that it took me seven days to cross um, mm. through the Great Vic and the Gibson Desert. Now, just the sheer isolation was um, was really haunting at times. And I went through the old uh, atomic testing sites where there was, and I found these old airfields, and they were just deserted, like. Someone had just like left in 1950, and and never no one had ever returned. So there was a real, um, again, we talk about that spiritual energy of the land. There was a real sense of sadness and loss in that whole region, uh, which I just felt. I just felt it in my like. Wow. I just felt it, you know. Um, especially, certainly going through um, one. I went through one section of bush that was really badly burnt, and it was like. It, you know, this huge bushfire went tearing through and then nothing ever came back to life. And I just, I could feel, I had the feeling of eyes on me, like looking at me, staring at me from, you know, you know that feeling you get when you feel like someone's watching you? Yes. I had that feeling. I had that feeling that whole day on the bike. So I just looked, I kept, kept my look, kept my eyes down and just got the, opened the throttle and got through that section as quick as I could. Wow. Um, but yeah, there were some really scary moments. And I think on the third day, in that particular desert, I hit a tree and lost my water, mm. and had to make up some. Had to make up about 350 kilometres uh, to get to my next resupply point, which is which is on average that, that should have taken about two days of travel. And a, a sandstorm came blowing in, and it was really really horrible. It was just horrible, and I had to. Um, I actually had to drink my urine to um mm. to get through that stretch and try and conserve what little water i had um or spent you know or th the consequences could have been fatal yes yes i remember you you sharing that you even have um youtube videos yeah there there's if you go to my website daringdeventure.com.au there's links to my social media like instagram facebook uh there's videos all over youtube um, I, I, doc I made sure I do I the, the whole thing was well documented uh, from start to finish. Wow, cool man! And that I, I'll take a step back a bit more because um, I, I'm curious to see what, how did the desert idea come about, man? Why, why? <laughs> uh, I, I know I read the book and I'm just like I, I still can't compare because I met you and I did, you know. And yeah. I, I know, I remember you told me this. Then I read the book. I'm like, man, the desert. Why would you want to take on ten of them at once, bro? Like, uh, you know, it's it's just a funny thing. So again, it comes down to my competitive nature, and I I done the compass points. You know, I done, I, I I I did Cape York on my motorbike. I did Fraser Island. And I I got back to Melbourne around Christmas, and I just I really wasn't ready to go back into the the norm the normal dull pull of society. I just, mm -hmm. I just felt it wasn't ready in my veins. Um, so you can imagine how well I'm doing in lockdown here in Melbourne, by the way. Um, <laughs> so then yeah. I just started um, I started looking into new adventures and new challenges, and I looked at doing the Simpson Desert, and I thought, oh, the Simpson Desert, oh, yeah, everyone's done that, you know, yeah. or there's heaps of stuff on you. And then I looked at doing um, the Canning Stock Route, and then I thought, oh, a few people have done that. But then I sort of figured, well, hang on, what if I did that and then rode over there? And I thought, well, and just sort of pieced it all together. And um, mm -hmm. piece it all together, and it, it was just under seven thousand kilometres, and there's not one single bit of bitumen road for seven thousand kilometres through wow. Central Australia, and um, it just it could, no one had ever done it. Um, and it's actually when I put it up on a motorbike riders forum, uh, a lot of guys said it was impossible that the distances mm -hmm. were just too far to travel mm -hmm. through the central through Central Australia. Certainly on a on a motorbike, one up with not only your, your fuel, food, water, tools, camping gear. They just said it was um, impossible. Now, look to to combat that. I carried fifty liters of fuel on a bike on a two fifty cc motorbike with, and through the longest stretch of desert where there was no wells or bores, I had twenty two liters of water on top of that. Plus my camping gear, plus my food supply, my ten-day resupply of food, all strapped to my bike. So it was like a mobile fuel barge. I mean, wow. I, I actually, when I look back, when I think about it now, I think, how the hell did I get through? That was um, to get with it, that load on. I travelled close to eight hundred kilometres across just sand dunes and rocky track, 
and that was that was desert where I didn't see anyone for three or four days. So yes. it was a it was a pretty pretty harrowing sort of ride and a pretty harrowing couple of days on the bike. And I understand now why people said it was impossible to do, uh, yes. or why it was so dangerous. Yes. Wow. And you did it, man, and then got recognized for it. And what was it like, uh, you know, being acknowledged by the Guinness Records uh, to know that you've done that? You, you know what? It was actually, um, it was a very special feeling because so many times I'd fallen short on a few things in my life. Like, I, you know, again, growing up with that um, feeling impoverished mentality, like I wanted to prove myself. So I wanted to be a clear, I wanted to be a special forces soldier and I never got there. I mm -hmm. wanted to be a firefighter and I never got there. And, I, and then I finally got into the police force and they kicked me out. And it's mm -hmm. like, I just kept fall, falling short of all these things. And I felt like I just had something to prove. And I guess it was just this um, acknowledgement that, or this credibility that the, the ride allowed me to have, like, you know, you've done something and, and actually, I feel I don't feel like I need to prove anything or keep on pushing myself. Like I don't need to to find the next big adventure, and because the next one will, I guarantee, like after the deserts, the next one will kill me. You know, that's yeah. I, I I don't feel like I need to keep on uh, pushing the boundaries. Like yes. now I now now I feel like I want to give something back and help other people find their push their boundaries and discover their potential. That's like my time in the spotlight, I guess. You know, my my time of proving myself is is past now. So it was. Mm. Yes, that, that, that's it. And I know I felt that from the story that you shared. Uh, so going through this process and when you were in, you know, the desert and then not only that, but also your journey around the country, what did you discover about you? Like, what was the things that you discovered? Uh, I know it was a healing journey. I felt that through the book. And what was it that um, you discovered about you that really um, moved you to who you are now? Look, I, I've, I've just, there, for me, like, and growing up, and look, there's this deep, you know, that that negative voice inside your head that, uh, that tells you you can't do things or that things are impossible, you know? I, I really learned to, to really notice that and acknowledge that, but also not listen to it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, that little voice has held me back in so many pursuits in my own life that now I'm like, well, actually, if I want to do something, I can actually just do it. All I need to do is stop feeling, stop, stop listening to those limiting beliefs and, cer and certainly stop listening to the the sideline um the negative the negative people in your life or in the world i guess because the, the people who sit in the grandstand and and poke uh, and give your um give their opinion aren't the people that you want to be listening to in your life yes yes and there's there is a lot of them um you know do that uh but once once you know you you set that that um that presence and they see not only your accomplishment, but what you stand for and your values. I believe your people become more conscious of that. They start get, gravitating toward that, that energy. Uh, it's interesting because you, you and I, we met on, on powerful presentation, right? Uh, mm. And uh, that was, that was kind of the pinnacle of the journey where, you know, going through my, my, my particular, uh, how you call it, story at that time, uh, with all the limiting beliefs to kind of un un uh, expose and crack that open. Uh, that was yeah. the, that was a great experience, and we were actually met in a team with a group that we were in. Yeah, uh, and you know that was only I literally that was two weeks after I got out of the desert. So yeah. I got out of the desert. And two weeks later, we had so powerful for your listeners. Powerful presentations is a is a is a as self development program and business course, and it's extremely confronting. And it's me and Patrick. Insane. I had a really confronting moment where I just lost my shit. <laughs> Absolutely lost it. I wish someone had filmed that. Yeah, but I know, but but I think um, it's great. Like if people have the opportunity to experience it, they go through that uh, because you know we were both in open, vulnerable spaces in our lives. You just come back from the desert. I was going through my journey, and then it was amazing. And I I, I believe a lot of great things happened. I mean, here we are right now sharing the stories. It was. Um, a Crazy, dude. Crazy. 
It was putting a lot of um, great things out in the world. Uh, so what's next for you, brother? What's next um, uh, with the book, with your life, your journey? What is it that you have um, in your sights? So, you know, I, I do want to give back now. It's, time, it's my time now to give back. Uh, look, so publishing the book has been an amazing experience and, and I've been trying to, during corona and lockdown, I've, I've, you know, I really, when I got back out of the desert this year, I had a few schools booked in and I was going to start doing some public speaking. Um, obviously, with corona, that's all fallen to the wayside for, for the time being. So we, we've put a lot of things in place. We're setting up. I want to do another expedition across the 10 deserts next year um, with a whole convoy of support vehicles and motorbikes. So that's, uh, I'm doing all the logistics around that. Believe it or not, I've, I've, I've contacted over 20 insurance companies. As soon as I say, you know, I'm doing this, it's never been done and it's motorbikes and it's desert, they all go nuts. So I've had, I've had over 20 doors shut in my face to get um, support for that. So I'm still looking into that. Um, I've been recording. This is my room because I've been, I don't know if you can see, but because this is my recording studio, my makeshift recording <laughs> studio on the side here, which is just my bed up on its side, um, my bed up on its side with my mattress and blankets hang hanging over the top. So I've been recording audio books as well. That will be uh, that will be released on the 10th of next month. We'll do a book, a virtual virtual book launch um, via Zoom, which, you know, if your listeners want to listen into that, it'll be great. And that coincides with, um, coincides with World Mental Health Day. So this year, this month I'm sort of trying to get my message out there about positive mental health and positive routines. Yes. And yeah, so there's, there's, there's certainly a lot going on. And, you know, between all that, I've got to somehow pay the bills and make it all happen financially. So I'm still working all the time, still up on the roof. Yes. And, um, but I think next year, 2021, is really set to be a, a big year because uh, the, the audio book's coming out. This book, I'll be up on the public speaking circuit and I'll be promoting the, the, the Odyssey next year into the desert, which will be just, which will be another adventure all in itself. Yes. Yes. And um, guys, uh, those tuning in, I just I put that um, website back up there. It's um, daringtoventure.com.au. Uh, and brother, once the book comes out, the audio version, please uh, send, it, send it over to us and we'll, we'll um, share that with our people. Absolutely. And, uh, also, would, would love to get you back on to have a, a conversation around that, man. And especially the journey. When this, I want to say when, because I believe that you'll make all, all of this happen. Uh, you, I know you to be that type of guy. Uh, so when all this happens, I would love to you know, be involved in some way, whether it's doing this, covering it all, uh, and sharing the word out there. So I think that's a, a powerful, um, you know, a powerful adventure to be, uh, I have, to be building. Pat, I, you know, I have another adventure in the pipeline up my sleeve, which will okay. probably, uh, which will probably um, require me to circumnavigate uh, Thursday Island on a jet ski. That's so, here, you know, you're in, you're in. You're going to be I'm running here. support, running support for that. Oh, good, so that's, bro. I'm I'm yeah, I'll keep you in the loop on that one, mate. Too good, bro. No, I would love to hear. I, I can't wait to see that happening. <laughs> Uh, bro, thank you, man, for your time to come on here and sharing your story. It's very inspirational, especially, like I said, you know, for, for males, being one of them who was very, um, you know, very close with emotions and, uh, you know, looking at, there was a big part of my life that I was so focused on outside perception of what an idea of a man was that if I showed any vulnerability or weakness, it would be uh, weak of me to do that. And, you yeah. know, coming through this journey to our point where we met in powerful presentations, that was my discovery. And for you to be able to come on here and share that and allow, um, you know, men folks to be able to um, see that, you know, even though as a high driven person as you are, it's okay to be vulnerable and open and share these stories. And I uh, commend you for that. And I thank you for sharing the story, brother. Pat, thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. I can't believe the time has just flown by so quickly. Hey, so it does, it does. But before you go, I got one question that I ask everybody who graces us here uh, on this on PowerCast. If you had one 
value that you could share or you would share with our listeners out there? Just one. I know we have a whole heap that we have carry in our lives. One value that you want to give back as a gem for people, someone to carry in their life, what would that be? You know, it's um, my, my one key value would just be be absolutely true to yourself. You know, don't have the courage to stand firm in the face of adversity and be true to yourself and not let other people dictate how you should be and act. And when you are true to yourself, people who love you for yourself will enter your life and you'll be able to have these wholesome relationships with people that matter the most to you that you resonate with. And don't be afraid to be outside the box. Benji, brother, thank you very much. Thank you very much for talking about hunting fear and um, sharing the story. I wish you all the best and success um, to what's coming up. Keep me in the loop, man. I'm there. I'll support you. I will, mate. Cheers, mate. You're a legend. Thank you so much, Patrick. Thank you. Till next time. See you, bro. See you. Well, there you have it, guys. That was uh, Benji Brunden uh, talking about hunting fear, but also sharing his story um, about traveling the 10 deserts of Australia. He done it under 30 days, man. Get his book of record, but more importantly, uh, documenting his um, journey through life and sharing that through his book, Hunting Fear. So if you have a chance, go and get that. Uh, I'll put that link up one more time uh, for you guys to have a look. It's uh, daringtoventure.com.au. I enjoy the book, man. I recommend it highly to anybody who wants to um, you know, experience that and see, uh, especially from a male perspective, things that we go through and how we, um, Benji overcome that. But I took away a lot of valuable uh, jewels, especially the goals that he said in that. Uh, coming up um, next week, uh, I'll have a special guest, which I announce on Monday. Uh, but I want to thank everybody. I take the time to thank everybody who's been continuously supporting for these uh, episodes. With six episodes in, uh, when I started this program, it was once again an idea to be able to share positivity and creativity, inspiration and empowerment in a time where the pandemic uh, effect really, really uh, was weighing on people's um, emotions. And we put it together uh, as a response to that, uh, just to come on here, but for myself personally to be able to bring people like Benji on and, uh, and have these conversations. And we have since then... You know, reached out and touched a lot of people everywhere that I've been traveling all throughout Queensland. People have heard about a power cast and also commented on the golden mic. Thank you very much for that. The mic's the hero. Uh, I love the golden mic. <laughs> but um, it, it's been empowering to hear everybody uh, uh, support and thank my team, the OBHI team and, you know, the power cast team who does all the stuff during the week and in the back end setting this up. We started as an idea and now we're fully fledged. So this is definitely um, what we are set out to doing now. You can be sure that Powercast is here and it's not going anywhere anytime soon, uh, except propelling up and bringing you more inspirational stories. Uh, coming up in the next couple of weeks, I'll be announcing a few things uh, with the performances that we're doing at Cairns. One of them right now I'm putting up on the screen is um, uh, the Sounds by the Sea. In If you're in Cairns, uh, the Sound by the Seas will be at the Salt House on the 4th of October. I'll be there performing live. We will have also Night Shift, uh, and we'll have a cultural experience for you on the 4th of October. So if you are in town in Cairns, please lock out that date and come and join uh, the brothers and sisters and celebrate with a little bit of reggae R&B and a little bit of Sunday vibes. Uh, and that will be something that we... We'll be excited to put on that. It's been a while since I've hit the stage, so I'm eager to get back live. Uh, and you'll see Night Shift do what they do best, is entertain. Uh, and once again, also, we have the um, the Powercast Spotify playlist. If you go and check out that, you can hear all the music that we're vibing to right now. For a Friday night, the great songs to have a listen to. First Nations people on there. Uh, a mix of a collective um, uh, music compositions that we like to, I like to jam to. I gotta say a shout out to my brother Underdwala for helping me curate the list uh, to share with everybody out there. Uh, I, I'm sure you will enjoy it. I'm definitely gonna be uh, bumping this tonight. And um, other than that, man, I just once again thank you for your support. It's been um, amazing. And you can see a lot of bigger, better things coming out from Powercast as we take uh, you on this journey of discovering inspiration and empowering people of Australia. Um, that's all I have for you guys tonight. Uh, thank you for...
taking the time to share your Friday evening with me. I've been uh, honored and blessed uh, to entertain you. Uh, please go tell everybody about PowerCast and what we're about. Uh, we value feedback and comments. So if you have any, please put it on the Facebook page. Uh, PM me privately because what we want to do is be able to be better at what we do and bringing you these stories. Um, apart from that, we would love you to be a part of our community. So join us. Uh, like us on Facebook, the Mile Power page that you're watching the stream from. Subscribe to YouTube. We really want you to be there uh, subscribing and share this to everybody that you know because these jewels that our, our guests put on here are life jewels, come from life experiences, and we really need to have these stories at a time like this. Well, that's me from tonight, the Golden Mike from the North, all the way from the very tip, Thursday Island, Waibani, up in the Torres Strait, Kaiwalaga region on Kawareg land. I have been your host, Mao Power, saying Kei so for joining me. And you know how we do it here on the Power Nation Powercast platform. Stay inspired, stay empowered, and stay connected. Esso.